Thanks for joining us um, for this Marketplace Room on Digital Innovations. My name is Camden Hoffman, a Global Planning Committee member with Chorus International. As you know, uh, this Marketplace is one of the most interactive events of the conference, and we will be listening to stories, ideas, and projects um, that organizations around the world have implemented uh, related to child and adolescent health. Um, we encourage you to actively participate, ask questions, and share ideas with our presenters. Uh, please use the chat box to type in your questions and comments during the presentation. We will have time for question and answers after each of the presentations, but in the meantime, you can send your questions through the chat. Um, I'm going to turn my video off during that session just to, to protect bandwidth for other people around the world, um, but I'd like to introduce our presenters. Our first speaker, our speakers, uh, our first speakers will be Sarah Shannon, Executive Director and uh, Lead Presenter from Hesperian Health Guides, and she will kick off the room sessions with Johanna uh, Kujabejo. Johanna will and and her colleague Sarah will, will be co-presenting Family Planning Mobile App Supporting Adolescents and Adults During the Pandemic. She will be followed by Kavita Ayagari. Director Marketing of Marketing and Partnerships with Ho Howard Delafield International. And she will be presenting Game of Choice, Not Chance, project funded by USAID, and she's based in India. And last but not least, we will have Stephen Meyer, the Director and St of Strategic Partnerships with Viamo, and Raul Joseph, Program Manager with Sergo Ventures, who will present the Pediatric Symptom Checker Hotline. I will let the speakers introduce themselves and share a bit more about them. And so without further ado, I hand it over to you, Shannon. Hi, good morning. Um, for me, it's quite early. It's still dark outside where I live, but um, welcome. It's really great to see everybody. Um, and I, my colleague, jo Johanna, and I are going to be talking about Hesperian's family planning app. Um, a frequent attender of core group meetings. And um, as mentioned, I'm the executive director at Hesperian Health Guides. Johanna and I today are gonna to be speaking about the Family Planning app, which is an app that Hesperian developed. Um, and we're gonna be talking about how it's being used to extend services during the pandemic, as well as um, in large scale efforts to extend family planning services. So a little bit of background about Hesperian um, and our history with women's health promotion and health information. Um, we're very well known for, for creating materials that are used to train frontline health workers um, and to do self-care and community level health promotion. Um, those of you that work in uh, community health work spaces and work with community health workers are probably familiar with some of our resources, such as Where There Is No Doctor. Around Women's Health, we're well known for Where Women Have No Doctor, a book for midwives, Health Actions for Women, and many other materials. Our uh, print materials are available in 85 languages. Our online resources are available in 36. Uh, on a, in a mobile friendly platform. And then we began to develop mobile apps as well to extend this information further. Uh, we have a suite of three reproductive apps, uh, which you can see here, uh, Safe Pregnancy and Birth, Safe Abortion, and the Family Planning app that we're gonna be talking more about today. One thing about all of our apps is that they are uh, accessible offline and without a data plan once they are on to a device. So they can be used where data is expensive or bandwidth is weak. So a little bit of an overview about uh, the family planning app, which we encourage you to download. Again, it's free and you can see some information about where you can get that and we'll have a link at the end. Um, looking at the center uh, item on your screen, you can see the main uh, menu. Again, you can also observe that the information is presented in a really easy to read user-friendly format. Um, and the basic features of this app include uh, general information about contraceptives, how each method works. And the central component is a method chooser, an interactive method chooser that allows um, an individual to go through a series of fairly short series of questions to help determine the method that best suits their personal preferences. Uh, it also includes medical uh, contraindications, but it's really focused on uh, 
what will work best for an individual. Frankly, choosing the method that is most appropriate for the person is the way to ensure that you have effective contraceptive information. Um, the final component is um, a counseling section, section on advice around how to do counseling around contraceptions. The, the core research that led to the development of this app was uh, foundational research with community health workers, frontline health workers, and others who, uh, as to what are the barriers to delivering effective uh, family planning services for those individuals. So midwives, nurses, community health workers, and other uh, advocates identified two primary barriers to uh, effective uh, contraceptive services. One is a lack of comfort talking about sex, which is fairly necessary if you're going to talk about uh, preferences for family planning um, methods. The other was actually difficulty managing the different kinds of technical details required around the different methods to help choose effectively. So the app is really designed to overcome those two major barriers that our, formation, that our foundational uh, research in 15 countries indicated was the main problem. Um, it, it is designed for in for uh, peer promoters, frontline health workers, and uh, other sorts of advocates to support counseling. It is also used by and was tested for use by uh, women themselves to help determine the best method for themselves. So it's a very adaptable tool and it was, uh, again, it was tested. Uh, we tested a beta version of this app in 12 countries in Africa and Latin America. Um, one of the things that people appreciated in addition to the fact that it operates offline once onto a device is that the contraceptive methods that are not available locally can be turned off in the settings so that they don't get recommended through the uh, method chooser questionnaire. That's really important because it can be very frustrating if the answers and the recommendations keep coming out to methods that can't be delivered and aren't available. So that was one of the features that people really appreciated and was um, enhanced through the testing. We have begun to add country specific information, which was one of the uh, requests that was made during testing, which is that you can look up what country you're in and get additional information such as links to clinic locators and other relevant information around contraception access and family planning services. To date, the app is in four languages. It's in English, French, Spanish, and Swahili. And we are in the process of adding three more languages, Afan Oromo, uh, Amharic for Uganda, for Ethiopia, and Kinrwanda for Rwanda. We're very excited to be introducing the app at large scale and national levels. And one of the things that we're looking forward to actually discussing with you are some of the different ways and applications that it can be used. One example is that the uh, Ministry of Health of Ethiopia is introducing the app to health extension workers this spring to facilitate health extension workers extending contraceptive services. It's a real effort and a real push to get uh, family planning counseling happening outside of clinics and at a local level. There's also a lot of interest that we are pursuing and Johanna's gonna speak about this more um, in the conversation part of our, of our time. Um, there's real interest in Burkina Faso, in Rwanda, and other uh, countries for sort of national level and large scale implementation with midwives, frontline health workers, nurses, and through other sorts of channels. And one of the interesting things that we've been uh, discovering is that some of the folks that were using the app already uh, began to try and adapt it and have it support their work as they were trying to adapt their work in the context of, of COVID. I mean, it just, I mean, it makes sense even outside of COVID that family, moving family planning counseling out of clinics is, is the best way to extend services. But this takes on a new urgency in the context of COVID and the pandemic. So two examples of how partners are using the app in this context. Um, and doing some creative adaptation is uh, Wings in Guatemala, where they were using the app 
and their peer promoters were using the app as a tool to support their uh, peer counseling around family planning choices. During the pandemic, those peer-to-peer -peer person conversations are not as easy to have and shouldn't happen. So what they are doing instead is they're having the individual who is being counseled download the app onto their own device, go through the method chooser, and then share the results back to the counselor over the phone or over a WhatsApp chat so that they can then go through a counseling conversation. This is a particularly effective way to do it over chat when there's some difficulties with privacy which is another issue that's coming up during the con in the context of the pandemic and lockdowns. Um, Guatemala is a country where there's been a lot of lockdowns. Um, it's also being used uh, for hotline workers and it's being used as tr it, for training purposes for hotline workers and for peer promoters. Uh, another good example of those two uses is Aprofam also in Guatemala. So we wanted to save as much time as possible as is um, the way of uh, core group meetings in general to open this up to more conversation and discussion with you. Um, before we do that, let me just say that you can see the link to how to download the app here on this last slide and really invite you. Um, we are really interested to partner with other organizations to learn more about how the app can enhance the delivery of contraceptive services and counseling. So that's really the conversation we'd like to have with you today. Um, and we'd like to hear your thoughts and ideas for how it can be used in that context. Um, I think it, while we're fielding questions and people who wanna speak to this, um, I'm gonna just invite Johanna, my colleague, to uh, speak for a minute or two about some of the work that she's been doing with organizations interested in using the app in Francophone Africa. Hey, hi. Uh, so I'm Johanna Kugbejo, and I'm working with Sarah Shannon and Hesper and Help Guides. Uh, nice to uh, meet you all. Uh, so yes, um, part of my um, work at Hesperian is to uh, do some uh, outreach around the uh, family planning app in Francophone Africa. And so I started uh, doing that. Uh, actually, it was right during the pandemic. So it's pretty interesting uh, to do because, um, well, the one of the first thing that people were saying to me was, yes, I mean, we really need this, especially right now uh, during COVID because we can send information to people. Um, what's also, so I've been talking mainly to um, health providers, especially midwives and also um, peer uh, promoters and advocates, activists uh, who work around uh, reproductive, reproductive health. Um, and it's been really interesting because uh, some of them have been really interested um, in uh, unfolding programs, in, uh, including the uh, family planning app on a large scale. So we're talking right now um, uh, like on how you know about how uh, to best do that. Um, and it's been really interesting because the idea is really to um, go to remote area, I mean, is that the app can really go to remote areas, um, either through people downloading the app if they have access to internet or to data because it's the uh, very, the really the, um, I mean, it's how they can get it, but also, you know, uh, just if the health promoter is there uh, with the app, they can show the app to people and, you know, um, ask them question or have them, for example, uh, answer the questionnaire or the, um, the method choose a questionnaire. So, uh, yes, I mean, I think that is really shows that it can be a really great tool and uh, we're actually pretty excited to uh, try to uh, to help uh, these people uh, use the app at a larger scale. Um, yeah, that's about it. Do you want to add anything, Sarah? No, no, I think actually um, use a little bit of this time to hear from others. Again, we're really interested in um, 
hearing your suggestions. We'd love to partner with, with organizations to use the app. And obviously you'll want to learn more about it first, but we'd love to talk with you about that either today or offline and out of the core group meeting. So um, Camden, are you going to read the questions or how, how's this sure. going to work? Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, the, the one uh, person would like to know if you can share the reference for the foundational research that you mentioned. Um, okay, so we conducted that ourselves. Um, we conducted it through Hesperian Works um, with partners in 120 countries. So these are like peer partners. Um, so we did outreach and interviews and surveys um, in 2018, um, 2017 and 2018 to determine that those were the main barriers. Um, I think that I can also cite some other uh, research that has come up with similar kinds of conclusions, and I can maybe post that after the after this conversation in the Google Doc. But yes. the research was actually conducted by us. That'd be great. Um, and Mohammed is asking, is it possible to make adaptations to the application? Well, we the the idea of the app is actually that all of the different local all of the different languages are riding around inside of the same app. Some of that was due to the fact that in testing circumstances, people really valued a multilingual uh, app. And part of it is so that we can keep all of the information updated across languages. That said, every time a translation is done and it's done often with partner organizations, localization does occur. Um, and so that kind of adaptation it happens all the time, including changes in images and um, changes in wording. Some of the FAQs change, the country specific information changes. And um, as I mentioned before, uh, the default settings on uh, things like the method choosers so that which methods will not be recommended um, can be preset. So those are some of the kinds of adaptations that have been happening, but we'd be interested to explore ideas and thoughts as well. Great, and, and I actually had a question. Um, I, th I think when you're looking for new uh, uh, partners to try out this application, I think um, uh, I, I work for Momentum Integrated Health and Resilience Project, and um, it'd be interesting to see how we can adapt these in fragile settings as well, um, given limited connectivity. Um, mm -hmm. One last question before I move on to the next speaker. Um, how will this app work? Uh, this is Shamia. How will this app work for people who do not have health, do not have literacy? Also, it implies the person has minimum resources to buy a smartphone and bear the monthly bill for internet. But if a woman or adolescent girl in a Bangladeshi sl slum, how it can how can it be introduced? Okay. Well, um, there's a couple of different questions in there, and I'll answer them. Um, the first the first thing is mm -hmm. that. One of the main uses of the app has been actually in the hands of frontline health workers and health promoters. So um, it's not necessarily being envisioned that that um, teenage girl in Bangladesh would necessarily have a high-end phone. That said, we've actually tested this app on um, tablets, which are much less expensive. And it does work just fine on tablets as well, because again, once it's on the device, it doesn't require data or internet. Um, that's also one of the ways that keeps the cost low because um, often if this is being used, um, people uh, introduce the app in a workshop where there is some Wi-Fi, the app is downloaded onto their devices and then they can it, it can operate offline from there on. Um, in terms of literacy, one of the things that we will be testing and will be introducing in the future is an audio feature. In other words, that can, um, that lets you play the different questions um, with voice instead of um, just reading or to company reading, depending on the context. Um, so that can also assist where there are l literacy issues um, or where the language being used is not necessarily the first language of one or the other of the participants and it can just help. Um, we'll be testing that in 2021. Great. Well, thank you so much, Sarah and jo Johanna. Really appreciate um, your presentation. Um, Kavita, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you. And again, um, we'll post some links, but we look forward to hearing from folks about your interest. Just, I post, I put the link on the Google Docs already. So if you want to take a look at after you can. Yeah. 
So hello, uh, my name is Kavita Ayagiri and I represent uh, um, Howard Delafield International. And uh, I'm going to be talking about our project called Game of Choice, Not Chance. And I'm just about sharing screen. So this is the project I'm going to be talking about. And it's, uh, it's really exciting because it's the first of its kind game that we are devising for young girls age 15 to 19, and uh, they're based in India. So the Game of Choice Not Chance is a project funded by USAID, and um, it's led by Howard Delafield International, which I represent. We're a behavioral insights consultancy firm based in DC. And uh, in our project, we have four partners. We have Indus Geeks, which is designing this game for us. They're based in India and Mumbai. We have Vihara Innovations, which is actually helping us with uh, design testing with girls and also are the creative designers of this game. We have Girl Effect, which has been you know, responsible for um, the research, the exploratory research that we did to come up with this game. We have Cycle Technologies, which is on board as a partner. They're, uh, they're uh, the developers of Cycle Beads, Fertility Cycle Awareness app. And we have Nami Art Technologies, who's also a partner with us. They're also based in the US. So uh, quickly getting into what the game is really about and what are we endeavoring to do. Um, the game is actually, um, it's at the center of three basic principles that we've adopted for this game. One is adolescent sexual reproductive health content. We've tried to marry that with a direct to consumer game. And therefore the entire thing is all about adapting or giving a tool which is directly in the hands of girls uh, using the principles of game-based learning, which is basically play as a strategy and role-playing as a means to get the girl to experience some of the, you know, some of the outcomes of the choices that she has to make through the game and the concepts of adolescent sexual reproductive health, which basically means that the game covers issues such as uh, menstrual health, it covers consent, it covers negotiation with parents and boyfriends, it covers uh, contraception, and finally it covers uh, decision making about how do you really delay early marriage and how do you really uh, convince others that you may have a career path or an education path in your mind. And all this, uh, the game actually also allows us to do behavioral analytics with this, which is within the game, as the girl plays and as she makes choices. And we're also using a predictive analysis uh, when she makes these choices to predict, how is it that will she behave in a similar manner in real life as well? So this is the game. I mean, tentatively it's called My Travel Diaries, but it's going to have a different name when we finally launch it. We're in the development stage right now. So the innovation that we've come up with is that this is a mobile game which is designed to enable girls to experience the power of their choices and voices and gain, you know, uh, gain the ability to shape their own futures. So our aim really is through this game, we want to increase girls' fertility awareness. We want them to know about uh, menstrual um, management. They want, we want them to understand about menstruation and its link with fertility. We want to build agency of the girl to refuse sex and negotiate contraception. We want to encourage communication with her parents and her support networks, with her partner, with her boyfriend. And we also want to provide links throughout the game to relevant resources. And when we say relevant resources, we mean information, we mean products, and we mean services. So our approach is really that of role play. So in this mobile game, we want players to engage in virtual role play so that they can build their knowledge, they can build their skills, and they can build their confidence to use these. And also our entire approach is direct to consumer. So when she plays the game, she will also through the game get connected to information and connections to real world resources, which we are trying to deliver directly into the hands of girls. So what is or how does the game work? So the game works on three vitals, a set of vitals which we've basically used to give her a score. So these three vitals are health, relationships and confidence. And 
as she plays the game, it's a choice-based game. So as she plays the game, she gets a score. If she makes a good and healthy choice, if she is able to negotiate a relationship, you know, without letting it deteriorate or without harming herself, and if she displays confidence, which is self-esteem and self-efficacy when she is playing the game. So these three vitals really get scores in the game. So just so that the concept is not so abstract anymore, this is the game. Our protagonist is a young girl called Nisha. She's around 18. She's actually 19 years old. She lives in a small uh, crowded corner of Delhi, which is the capital of India. And she struggles between you know, her parents' expectations of her to be a good girl and her own dreams. Um, a chance encounter with a doctor, you know, leads her to an offer of internship and uh, she gets to travel to produce a web series. The doctor is shown here. She is the, she is the, the, the lady in the yellow uh, silver kameez and she's an um, inspiring woman because she's not only a doctor, but she also wants to do something else. So with her travels with the doctor, she gets to meet a set of women who have actually pioneered and done something very differently. So, and also gets, um, you know, introduced to all these five pioneering women. One of them is a scientist, one is an inventor, one is a YouTube influencer, one is a nurse and one is a policewoman. So she gets to meet these women and she also, through the process, gets to learn about, you know, menstrual health. She gets to learn about consent. She gets to learn about contraception and the importance of safety. And she also gets to learn about negotiating with her parents to actually be able to tell them what matters to her. She also meets, uh, you know, a love interest through this game, the boy called Ayush. And, um, you know, all the subject matters of consent, of contraception, of safety are introduced through a set of these characters. And the main character is Nisha. So um, what do we want to do from this game and how, how do we want this game to work? So really we want to measure through the game, um, you know, what are the changes in knowledge and attitude within and across episodes? So there are five episodes in the game. The first is all about negotiating with parents to take up this job offer, which is this internship that she has been offered to travel with a producer. The second is really about um, finding out about menstrual hygiene management through introduction of a scientist who's doing research on menstrual hygiene. So she also gets to experience new uh, knowledge when she gets to meet these people. She gets to find out about new products. And through the uh, choice-based role play, she has to actually demonstrate whether she has understood what is being told to her or not. So again, this game allows us to measure changes in knowledge and attitudes within the game. It allows us to measure changes in confidence, to engage in specific in-game behaviors. We also check whether, you know, when she is playing the game, what is her in-game behavior? What kind of choices is she making? And also through the game, we are giving her access to real life resources, which is products, information, and services. And we are going to be able to check whether she accesses these products, whether she accesses these uh, resources or not. So really the key questions for us when we were looking at this game was that does playing the game of choice lead to changes in relevant health-related knowledge and attitudes amongst young women? Does playing the game lead to changes in self-efficacy or rel of relevant health-related behaviors? And finally, do in-game behaviors correlate with out-of-game self-reported attitudes and behaviors amongst young women? So these are the three things that we want to check within the game and then outside the game. And uh, just before we kind of this thing, I want to leave you with a sneak peek of this game. We're going to be ready with the game in 2021 July. So we, it's going to be downloadable for free and it's going to be available on Google Play Store. Here's what the game looks like. This year, his birthday was Kamal. Mommy gave a gift to Nisha, 
נשאר, אוי נשאר. कौन है यहाँ मैं तेरे सामने ही तो हूँ नई डायरी छोटो छोटी सामने आ तुम्हारी आंखों आल उसके बर्थडे पे कमाल हो गया मम्मी ने क्या गिफ्ट दिया उसे निशा निशा ओए निशा हाँ? कौन है यहाँ मैं तेरे सामने ही तो हूँ नई डायरी छोटो छोटी सामने आ तुम्हारी आंखों को आइसक्रीम बनाकर खा लूंगी आइसक्रीम क्या मी मुझे भी चाहिए एक मिनट क्या सच्ची तो डायरी ही है ऑफ कोर्स मैं कभी झूठ नहीं बोलती हाँ? मुझे खोल तो सही So that's really what the game is about. I thought that a small sneak peek would tell you about the girl. She is interacting with her diary, which she finds for the first time. The diary is also a tool that we've used for her to kind of talk to herself about things that she thinks about, that she should be doing, that she is not sure about. So it's an interactive tool medium within the game where the protagonist Nisha. learns to interact with it and ask the questions that she cannot ask others so that's really from my side and um i would be open for any questions that you may have great thanks kavita that was great and before we uh, move on to the next session i know that previous sessions are running a little bit behind so um i'll speak quickly and hopefully you can get to some of these good questions um the first is how many local languages in india are supported so the game is going to be in english and hindi so basically it's as of right now we're making a hinglish game because it's it uses both these languages and um, it's going to be available in these two languages first and then later we we plan to make it in every other indian language if uh, you know if if we find that it's very well received and it's doing very well great um and another question um how have you accounted for diversity of cultures and languages among indian girls so most of the 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 basis of this game is really it was made for the hindi speaking belt and now uh, in india there is uh, hindi is our uh, national language it is spoken by most of north indians so and there are fairly huge uh, number of uh, states that speak hindi as a language so that we we expect that we are going to be covering a whole lot of girls a whole lot of girls in this audience but when it comes to other languages we do want to be able to customize the game to other languages and we are already thinking of you know um probably looking at the major languages that are you know spoken by a huge number of other girls in the country as well but hindi and english in general in india is very uh, well understood and well spoken great and maybe um i would like it in marathi too yeah <laughs> <laughs> i would really like it in marathi as well Can you highlight the key outcomes again that will be assessed? Yeah, so I'll uh, just go back to that slide, and um, or maybe we can put them in the Google Doc to, as well. Yeah, I can. For some time, we can do that. That would be fabulous. Maybe so, also one question I have for you, um, Kavita, is where where uh, where did this idea generate from? Where where was this adapted from? So uh, it's an idea that came, uh, which is completely an original innovation idea, which is uh, by Susan, Dr. Susan Harvard, who's the co-founder of uh, Hugh HDI, Harvard Delafield International, and I think uh, she would have really loved to be part of this and answer this question herself. Uh, her inspiration really comes from her own personal life. Her mother actually made the journey to the U.S. and um, i mean that changed her life her mother's life as well as susan's life and a lot of this game is really about girls understanding that they have a choice that their decisions matter that what they decide can actually shape the future and um, so um, i think a lot of it is from susan's own personal uh, experience and story 
Great. Um, I've, I've added a couple of other questions that are coming in the chat onto the Google Doc, so feel free to go ahead and answer those. I'd like to now turn it over to our final speaker, uh, Stephen Meyer, um, and his co-presenter, Raul Joseph. Hi, everyone. Uh, Raul, I'll let you go ahead and present your screen there. Uh, so hi, everyone. Um, it's, it's really great to be speaking with you all. Um, so today, Raul and I are going to be talking about um, a symptom checker hotline. So before we get into it, just really brief introductions. Uh, I'm Stephen Meyer, the Director of Strategic Partnerships with Biyama. I'm Rahul. Hi, I'm um, Rahul Joseph. I'm a Program Manager at Servo Ventures. Great. Um, so before we get into um, uh, organizational introductions, uh, first we'll talk about the problem, kind of lack of access to health information in um, you know, low resource settings. Then we'll talk about Viamo's platform. Uh, we'll talk about COVID-19 as a case study that we did in partnership with Sergo, um, uh, Sergo Ventures. And then we'll uh, talk about how this is, has been applied to uh, pediatric symptom checkers. So uh, to start, I, I would like to ask kind of a poll question that we don't have uh, the poll functionality. So please answer in the um, chat box. Uh, when you or your child is sick and you need guidance, you know, pretending you're not a, a doctor yourself, which I think most of our audience is, um, where do you go for support? <clears throat> do you ask Dr. Google? Do you call a physician or a clinic? Do you, do you call a government hotline? Do you use a printed resource? Or other, please specify. Uh, and while you're answering, um, I can answer what I did or what my family did when we were growing up in, you know, rural Canada with, with no smartphones at the time. Um, so uh, I grew up in a small town far from a doctor uh, in a province called Ontario. There were three kids. Our family got sick all the time, and our mother was by no means a health expert. Uh, we relied heavily on a service called Telehealth Ontario. Uh, we simply made a free call, and we spoke to a nurse. Uh, guided by a computer, the nurse asked us simple questions about our symptoms, our exposure, our health history. And at the end of the conversation, the only options my family ever heard were either you're fine, relax. Um, or rest, stay hydrated, you'll be fine tomorrow. Uh, option number three, go to the clinic tomorrow, or finally go to the emergency room right now. Luckily, that was rare for our family. Uh, this system is still in place, uh, providing concerned mothers with, you know, the, no the power of knowledge, peace of mind, uh, and lowering the burden on our publicly funded clinics and emergency rooms. Glad to see another Telehealth Ontario user <laughs> in the group here. Um, so first, um, I before kind of talking about the mechanics of the symptom checker, I want to talk about the Viamo platform in general. Uh, so Viamo is a global social enterprise, and we have a vision for complete digital inclusion. We strive for the 4 billion people who have access to simple mobile phones, literate or not, to be able to conduct the same activities on their mobile phones as English literate smartphone users. In 2020, we uh, 30 million people access Viamo's platform. So at Viamo, we are not health experts, we're not agriculture experts, we're sector agnostic, and we're experts at reaching people on the basic mobile phones that they have in their pockets. Uh, the platform we oftentimes use for symptom checkers is called 321. Uh, it's a free to access audio-based health and livelihoods platform. You simply dial 321 from your telephone and you'll hear uh, something like, for English, press one, you know, for language B, press two, et cetera. And then you'll hear, welcome to 321. This call is absolutely free for information on health, press one, agriculture, press two, to find out where to vote, press three, solar panels, press four, et cetera. No, no smartphone required, no internet required, no literacy required, no phone credit required, and any language can be supported. Um, okay, Raul has a, a short video to play here. Go ahead, Raul. People everywhere want relevant, credible, and actionable information presented in an engaging way. And people want to access this information on their own devices, when they need it, wherever they are. Your organization produces information that can improve people's lives. But what if the people you want to reach don't have smartphones or internet access? And what if they have limited literacy? Are you only using billboards, radio messages and field staff to reach your audience? 
If so, are you sure who you have reached or the ultimate impact? You could be amplifying your message. The 3 to 1 service is your solution, providing your information to people and giving you back real-time impact data. The 3 to 1 service is accessible on any mobile phone. It is the most far-reaching mass communication service available. Why? Today, phones are the most prevalent communication channel in the world, more prevalent than radios in the developing world. How does it work? People call a short, toll-free number, such as 321. They hear spoken prompts in a voice and language they can understand. The menu is organized by topic, health, agriculture, financial inclusion, news, weather, governance and more. The 321 service partners directly with mobile network operators to provide free calls, ensure sustainability and reach millions of people. The information on the service is trustworthy because it is validated by local experts and government agencies. The content is optimized to engage with the people you serve. Usage data is used to understand user experience, knowledge retention and even attitude and behavior change. The 3 to 1 service is a proven model of social behavior change communication. Independent evaluations have shown that information accessed through the 3 to 1 service improves both knowledge and positive practices. So, how can you use the 3 to 1 service to provide beneficial information to a national audience? Uh, so, finally, yeah, if you could open that slide, same slide again. Um, as you can see here, uh, our platform is. The, the 321 platform is kind of the free to access hotline, uh, you know, no phone credit required, and it's available in those uh, 19 countries. Uh, we can also and do operate hotlines in, you know, about 100 other countries uh, outside of our 321 platform, and I'll talk about that. And so as um, as we go forward, um, you know, Raul will talk a bit about the COVID symptom checker that we have on the 321 platform, and it's just kind of one of many functionalities that's available on there. Uh, over to you, Raul. I think we have about uh, 10 minutes left. Great. Thanks so much, Stephen. And I'll keep this short so we get a sense of how the symptom check was used for a COVID uh, setting and how it can be extended to other areas as well. Before I begin, though, a little bit about myself. My name is Rahul Joseph. I'm a program manager at Sergo Ventures. At Sergo Ventures, we integrate behavioral science, data science, and artificial intelligence to bring precision to solutions. We try to move beyond a one-size-fits-all approach and design instruments to understand the needs of individuals and communities and work with governments and implementing partners to uh, deliver support that's targeted to these needs. We've developed a broad portfolio of tools to support the COVID response both in the US and Africa. And we've been collaborating with Viamo, as Stephen mentioned, and also the Clinton Health Access Initiative to create a symptom triage tool. Um, and this was developed to respond to two major gaps that we saw. One was a lack of easily accessible personalized information uh, during COVID. So citizens wanted to know if they were infected, uh, how they should protect themselves and their loved ones and where to seek care. At the same time, you know, there's a lot of information that exists on online, but not everyone has a smartphone and there are others who uh, have limited literacy levels. So how do we get more information available uh, to more people. On the other hand, there was also a paucity of granular data. Uh, in the absence of widespread testing for COVID, policymakers wanted to get a sense of who could be affected and where they should direct limited resources. And as cases rise, especially during a second wave, how can they use, um, how can they mitigate the surge that you might experience on uh, call centers and at hospitals? So we leveraged three to one to help to triage symptoms that people were reporting and provide them with. Uh, tailored behavioral recommendations. This solution had three main components. Uh, the first was a symptom checker. It's a long questionnaire that allows a caller to enter personal information, symptoms, signs of distress, and um, any existing health conditions. Thank you. I now need to ask a few questions about your symptoms. I will read out a list of common symptoms. If you have had them in the last 24 hours, please press one. If you have not had them, Press two. Based on the information um, callers enter, we're able to triage them into a risk group and suggest uh, a course of action. Thank you for checking your symptoms. You seem to show some of the symptoms we have commonly seen in patients with coronavirus. 
We understand that this can make you anxious, so please listen to our message carefully. And once uh, this recommendation is given out, there's also a mechanism not on three to one, but through Viamo's um, voice platforms to send out follow-up surveys. So after a few days, we're able to send out automated surveys to check if people actually perform the suggested behaviors and what their current health status is like. So I'll just play that. Again. Hello, thank you for calling 161 to check your symptoms for COVID-19 a few days ago. We would like to ask you a few follow-up questions. Just to say, uh, the service is called 161 in Uganda, which is why um, it was referred to as such in that message. So what this allows us to do is to set up an algorithm to provide uh, the right message and encourage the right behavior at the right time. Um, of course, those who are low risk need not um, seek care. They're, it's more important that they follow preventive behaviors. Those on medium risk should probably self-isolate and visit a doctor if the condition worsens. And high risk uh, candidates should call an emergency helpline and seek care immediately. Just to say these messages were developed in consultation with the Ministry of Health, and it's in line with what they want the population to follow. Um, and so we work cl very closely with them. The advice may different, uh, differ from one country to the next. I know I'm running out of time here, so I'll cycle through the rest of the slides very quickly. Um, you know, we've been running this pilot for about uh, since August, so in the fall, and in that short time, over 100,000 people have accessed the service, mostly in Malawi and Mali. We recently started this up in Uganda as well, and this is all organic traffic. We've not used any promotions, though we've recently started with a few in Malawi. And what's encouraging is more people access this service than the SMS or USSD hotlines that the Ministry of Health has uh, in Malawi. To give a sense of the operational rollout, I've got a few numbers from Mali to share. Um, what we're finding is that callers are sharing valuable data and remained engaged throughout the course of this symptom checker. That was a concern that we had going in. What you see in the chart on your left is how many people actually got triaged, um, which is about 53% of the whole. So these are people who stayed all the way through to the end um, and entered information so we could assign them to a risk group. Uh, and this is very encouraging because the average call duration is anywhere between uh, 10 to 12 minutes. Going one step beyond, those people who were triaged, of those about like 80% actually listened to the entire message, which is uh, also a long one and ranges from one to two minutes. Another way to look at the same data is to look at the drop-off by question. And what we found is that once people start entering information on the symptoms, the, they largely stay on. So this was a concern that we had, especially in the COVID setting, where we asked them a series of eight to nine questions on symptoms, then on the danger signs of health conditions and so on. And so what you see here is most of, about one third of the people drop off right at the beginning when we ask them for the demographic information. So uh, our guess at this stage is that these are people who are not as interested in the symptom checker and just stumble upon the service. But once they start entering information on say question four on their symptoms, they are largely uh, on the service and are keen to stay through to the end to listen to the recommendation. What's great about the service is that we're able to capture granular data and aggregate it and present it back to the government to act upon. So what you see on the left is just a visualization of the proportion of high risk callers. This is useful for the government just to follow up and uh, you know, understand what's going on in, with different uh, populations. So as I mentioned, there's a follow-up survey that could be used to uh, reach out to people. You could seek their consent to be contacted directly. Uh, you could check in to see if they're still experiencing symptoms, whether they sought care and uh, or got tested for COVID. We're currently working on studying the impact of uh, this solution and trying to scale it up. So we're trying to see how it influenced care-seeking behaviors. We now started running a few promotional campaigns and we're curious to see how that drives call volumes and we're working to integrate it with the government hotlines so we can extend its reach. In closing, I'd like to focus on the lessons learned, which is that we really discovered that this is generalizable to other diagnostic and triage tools and can extend to many disease areas. So one, it's feasible to set up. So three to one as a service can be uh, customized so you can have an algorithm, triage people and deliver tailored messages. More importantly, the tool is usable. So people are willing to enter detailed health information and listen to customized advice. Third, it can generate actionable data for the government to follow up. And fourth, something I touched on earlier, it's completely customizable and adaptable. We found this in a COVID setting where we had to change the messages from one country to the next. 
Um, but you could very well do the same for a child health or pediatric setting as well. Um, and I'll hand it back to Steven so he can just talk about the pediatric checkup. Great, thanks Raul. So um, uh, beyond COVID, we have done um, pediatric symptom checkers as well. So they were done before our kind of large scale free to access three, two, one. Uh, they were done on, on hotlines where users had to pay. Uh, so that obviously had some impacts on scale. But what our findings were is that caregivers accurately identified and reported their symptoms through the hotline uh, while talking to this pre-recorded or, you know, interacting with this pre-recorded voice. They reported time and cost savings related to transportation. Uh, they reported an increase in ability to make uh, decisions for their family. And they the the final report was that they required a uh, a system that had no airtime charges, and we've since solved that with uh, the three two one platform. So finally, I just want to say, you know, let's work together. Let's bring actionable, personalized family health decision support to people who have the largest obstacles to healthcare. Let's bring power and peace of mind to more caregivers. We're seeking local partners to bring this tool to, or you know, to work with us to bring this tool to new countries. Of course, we're seeking funders <laughs> and we're seeking uh, continued collaboration with health experts. So finally, uh, if you want to get in touch with us, um, please either fill out the form. I'll send that link through in the chat right now uh, or email us directly. Um, and now I'll open it up to questions. Great. Thanks so much to both of you for the presentation. Um, you have answered a couple of questions uh, as we've gone along. Um, the two questions are outstanding, and then I uh, will go back to the others. Are you keeping a, a re record of the patients that are using the services? Yeah. So um, callers to 321 specifically, um, we do not associate their phone number with their responses. We, we immediately assign a random ID. Uh, so that uh, personalized data information is is not shared. Great. And another person asked, um, why is it that uh, this is not has not rolled out in the Philippines yet? Is there are there any uh, options for that? Yeah. So uh, we don't yet have three, two, one, the kind of like general information hotline in the Philippines, but we are operating projects in the Philippines, um, and so you know we're we're seeking partners to to collaborate with and, and bring more projects to the Philippines. So whoever asked that question, please get in touch and, and I'll put you in touch with our Philippines uh, manager. And I just have one, one question before we wrap up this session. Um, sure. You mentioned I, this is, all of these presentations have been fa are fabulous. Um, a lot of successes with this, with this tool. Um, have you faced any challenges in rolling this out um, with uh, individuals? Hmm. Uh, Raul, do you have any thoughts on challenges? Sure. Uh, and there are quite a few, but off the top of my head, I think one is, you know, just uh, the process of getting approvals uh, during a time when, you know, we're in a pandemic, the ministries of health was really stretched thin in working with them. Uh, that was, um, it, it requires time and uh, multiple iterations. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, the other to, is to say that, you know, you, you, can, you have to tweak the service as you go along. So we put in a couple of questions, we saw what the responses like, then realized they weren't being interpreted as expected, and then we had to tweak them. So um, that's just part of the process, I feel. Uh, so I guess that's the second challenge um, I can I can highlight. Yeah, these are just two, uh, but they're, you know, that's come, that's par for the course when you're trying to implement a tech intervention. Great. Well, I just want to thank all of our presenters. Um, we are at time and we are going to go back into plenary, but this has been extremely interesting. Um, all of the notes and questions have been put into the, into the Google Doc, which is available to all of you through the chat. Um, these are very innovative um, uh, digital solutions in a very difficult time during COVID-19 and other uh, shocks and stressors that we will face in the future and especially in, in fragile settings. So I just want to thank all of the presenters for taking your time today to share these and we look forward to um, continuing the conversations. So thank you all.